Listeners, here on It's All Relative, we speak about some heavy topics, and it seems like there's a special level of difficult because it all relates to family. We have talked about some of the worst things one human being can do to another, and things done by the people who should be the most trustworthy. I think with all of that, it is time for something a little lighter. So today, I bring you the case of the kidnapping of Frank Sinatra Jr. But first, here's Jan and Dean to set the mood, and I'll see you on the other side. Well, you knew all along that your dad was wise to you. should have lied, now you shouldn't have lied. And since he took your set of keys, you've been thinking that your fun is off. You should have lied, now you shouldn't have lied. But you can come along with me, because we've got a lot of things to do. You should have lied, now you shouldn't have lied. And we'll have fun, 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 now that daddy took the tea. Disclaimer for any Sinatra superfans. Most of the information out there about Sinatra generally agrees with each other. However, Katie Kelly authored a heavily researched book about Sinatra's life that was unauthorized by Sinatra himself. He really didn't want her to publish. But according to an April 2nd, 2013 article in the Washington Post titled, Frank Sinatra Wanted Hit on Biographer Kitty Kelly, According to Paul Anka, By the way, that's a terrible title. I know journalism likes to not bury the lead, but why does that always result in these shit titles? Anyway, according to this article, Sinatra had actually worried that he'd be blamed if anything ever happened to Kitty Kelly. My point being here that I do use that book as a source, and there may be problems with this source, but then again, there are potentially equally problematic issues with authorized history. So just be aware that some of this tale should be taken with a grain of salt, and I'm not sure which part. Thus ends the disclaimer. Frank Sinatra was born in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1915. And let me just add that anytime I hear a reference to Hoboken, I always think about the chicken emergency book. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. It's a thing. Frank was a first-generation Italian-American. As the story goes, he was blue when he was born from the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. The doctor just assumed he was dead and left him to attend to Sinatra's mother, Dolly, who was still bleeding from the birth. Grandma, however, wasn't going to let him die for good. She dunked him in some cold water, some reports say she even gave him the classic swat on the bum, and he opened his eyes and started wailing. While there may be some truth to this story, it sounds like a hero origin story. And Frank Sinatra was destined to be the hero in every story he was in. His mother ruled the neighborhood from the cafe she ran. If anyone was going to fail at life, it wasn't going to be her son. No exaggeration, some reports of Dolly Sinatra make her sound like a Donna in the Mafia. They never actually say she has Mafia connections or that she's a mafiosa, but something about the way she is described definitely gives that kind of impression. Sinatra grew up loving the crooners, Bing Crosby, Frankie Lane, and he set out to be the best of them all. Dolly Sinatra, the possibly connected head of Hoboken, discussed his future with the manager of a local singing trio, and that trio quickly became the Hoboken Four. The group appeared on the radio and toured the clubs. Whether you like how he got the job or not, Frank became the linchpin of the group. They won contests, and women literally swooned because of Frank's voice. Eventually, Frank would leave the group for bigger and better entertainment things, and eventually he would also marry Nancy Nay Barbado in 1939. The two had three children, Nancy, of Walking Boots fame, Tina, and Frank. Family life in the Sinatra household was not cozy and homey. Nancy was a brilliant homemaker, and she loved Frank and her kids. Frank, however, was gone much of the time. People who knew him said he could be a bully when he wanted something a certain way. 
And having been raised as his mother's golden boy, Frank often wanted things a certain way. This is not to say that he abused anyone, at least not physically. There's no indication of that in either the authorized or unauthorized tales of his life. There is also, as far as I can tell, every indication that he loved Nancy and he loved his children. He was probably just shit at showing it. From what I can surmise, Frank was probably bipolar. It doesn't sound like he was full-on manic depressive, as it was once called. Today, that's pretty much known as bipolar 1. I am, however, not convinced he was completely bipolar 2, which is marked by periods of high energy or hypomania instead of the full-on mania of bipolar 1, along with relatively the same depressive levels. I'm not trying to diagnose him here. There's not enough for even a differential anyway. But it is important to his family situation for at least a peek at what his emotional and mental state was like to live with. And if anyone thinks I'm exaggerating, Frank did attempt suicide at least once. And when you have these conditions, your moods and your actions can be beyond your control. Especially if you are unaware that you are dealing with an actual mental condition rather than an issue of moral character, as this was often considered during the previous century. Oh, and this is not meant as an excuse, just a possible explanation of the situation. All of this boils down to a home life with Frank Sinatra kind of sucking. He was also what was once referred to as a hound dog. The man could not keep it in his pants. Honestly, this is a common symptom of bipolar disorder, so that is part of my in no way scientific guess at his possible condition. Considering his excessive sowing of wild oats, it is actually a bit curious that the only children he sired were the three with Nancy. You would think there would be bastards coming out of the woodwork. And I mean the word bastard in the literal sense. There is a rumor making the rounds, because that never happens, that Ronan Farrow is Frank's. I mean, if you look at Farrow, the son of Mia Farrow, and author and journalist extraordinaire. If you look at Pharaoh and then you look at Frank, he definitely looks more like Sinatra than Woody Allen. If it were me, I would probably be thrilled to call Frank Sinatra my father, particularly when the alternative is Woody Allen. But as far as the confirmation of this claim, there is none. It really doesn't make a difference to the story either way, and it is certainly no one's business to find out unless you are actually Ronan Farrow. Regardless, even if Ronan is Frank's and not Woody's, my point is that there should be many, many more children out there with the Sinatra bloodline. Eventually, Nancy can't put up with any of it anymore, and she divorces Frank. But I digress, yet again. Now for Nancy, Tina, and Frank, growing up the children of a Hollywood idol left some big shoes to fill. In particular, Frank Jr. felt he needed to carry on his father's legacy. It helped that he had the entertainment bug. Frank Jr. wanted to sing and play practically from birth. There is a bit of a controversy over how much he really wanted to croon like his dad and how much he was just trying to make his dad happy. He never had the success that his father did, but he did all right. It helped that he was better looking than his dad. Women loved Frank Sr.'s voice, but if they ever commented on his looks, it was often to complain how skinny and gawky he was. At the beginning of Frank Jr.'s career, he was touring the clubs, just like his father had. And it is here where things got a bit wacky. As strange as it may seem, kids of the Hollywood elite have to go to school. It is not uncommon for these kids to have tutors, but the Sinatra kids went to a brick-and-mortar school like the rest of the plebs. Nancy, the daughter, not the mother, went to high school with a guy she would forget, or perhaps she never even noticed him in the first place. His name was Barry Keenan. By late 1960, Barry Keenan was one of the go-to guys for investment tips, and he was the youngest member of the Los Angeles Stock Exchange. As these things sometimes go, Keenan lost pretty much everything, and by 1961, he was in a financial and personal hole. But Keenan was an idea man. Because of his former financial godhood and his time in high school with children of the Hollywood elite, his idea to get back on his feet was to kidnap one of the children of one of those big names. Now, Keenan's plan involved kidnapping no actual children. 
every potential kidnappee was in the young adult range of ages. He also had an exact amount figured out that he would need to dig himself out of his hole, $240,000. Keenan also thought the entire situation would only take a few hours. Steal a kid, get the money, bada bing, bada boom, everyone's happy. His first thought was to kidnap Bob Hope's son, Tony. But Bob Hope had been very active with the USO, and for those of you who don't know, the United Service Organizations, or USO, is a non-profit created in 1941 to keep up the spirits of the troops deployed during war. The USO made a huge name for itself during World War II, and that reputation was still very strong by the 1960s. Barry Keenan was nothing if not a patriot, and it seemed un-American to kidnap the son of Bob Hope the current mainliner in the USO. Frank Sinatra, however, seemed tough enough and savvy enough to handle a kidnapping situation. He also had nothing to do with the USO, so there was no blemish on Keegan's patriotism if he were to kidnap one of Sinatra's progeny. So, Keenan started planning the kidnapping of Sinatra's son, Frank Sinatra Jr. Keenan didn't think he could pull it off by himself, so he roped in a few co-conspirators. Joe Amsler, who had been friends with Keenan since childhood, and Johnny Irwin, his mother's boyfriend. Dean Torrance, of Jan and Dean fame, and yes, that's in the opening song, was also a contributor, although how much of one is a bit up for debate. Dean and Barry shared a safe deposit box, which to me seems just really weird, and Dean had been known to loan Barry cash since his situation had tanked. Torrance swore that he didn't know about the kidnapping plan, or at least he didn't know Keenan was serious. And there's no reason to think otherwise. The Crime Library website says that Keenan began planning the crime in 1961. I have found no other source that says this, and the kidnapping wasn't actually undertaken until the end of 1963. I really hope 1961 is not true because the plan actually put into place was riddled with holes and it would be an extra dig against Keenan if it also took him two years to come up with it all. According to Peter Gilstrap, in a 1999 interview with Keenan for the Dallas Observer, the first attempt to take Frankie Jr. was going to be sometime during his performance at the Ambassador Hotel on November 22, 1963. Barry thought he could give himself an alibi by attending a big football game that was going to be going on the next day and that's American-style football people. As if to remind everyone that none of these cases happen in a vacuum, John F. Kennedy was shot and killed on November 22, 1963. This meant that many public gatherings were canceled, and Keenan's opportunity to nab Sinatra Jr. was gone. His alibi opportunity was gone. And even more ironically, both his co-conspirators, Amsler and Irwin, were too heartbroken to do anything but grieve. The next best opening for kidnapping Frank Jr. was at his performance in Tahoe on December 8, 1963. That gave the two Kennedy supporters time to pick themselves up again and maybe narrow down the specifics on the snatch and grab. Right? Huh! At the time, Frank Jr. was 19 years old, although I did find something that said he was 20. Junior's style was a continuation of the crooning legacy. While he was a good crooner, consumer tastes had shifted towards beatnik and surf culture style, so he was not really making the success that his father had done. It was another era. Today, security would stop unwanted visitors from getting to the star like the Gestapo stopping a Passover feast. No one would know which room the star stayed in unless a paparazzo bribed the housing staff with a significant quantity of cash. In 1963, Keenan and Amser hijacked Frank Jr. right out of his hotel room. Quote from Kitty Kelly's biography. The kidnapping began on Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. when Barry Worthington Keenan, 23, and Joseph Clyde Amsler, his best friend from high school, also 23, knocked on Frank Jr.'s door at Harris Lodge in Lake Tahoe. Frank Jr. was eating dinner with Joe Foss, a musician in the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. Before their first show in the lounge, pretending to be from room service, the two amateur kidnappers barged into the room, bound and gagged Foss, and carried Frank off at gunpoint to their car, a 1963 white Chevy Impala with a broken muffler. 
which carried them through a mountain blizzard to a rented house in Los Angeles where they held young Frank for ransom, end quote. I would like to ask what the hell they'd been doing to that Impala. It wasn't more than a year old and the muffler was trashed. What the fuck, guys? With that being said, Keenan and Amsler surprisingly did not crash and burn in the beginning of this crime. It's got to be like seven hours to Tahoe from the LA area driving and they made it there and back in a blizzard. I'm from Minnesota. Blizzards are hard enough to navigate when you are accustomed to them. What I imagine from two L.A. boys does not make me think this trip was easy peasy. If they had gotten stuck in a snowdrift, I would have just thought, duh, but they made it with their captive in tow. What the kidnappers did not know was that Junior's mealmate, Foss, had gotten free of his bonds in minutes. Foss called the hotel's press agent and the press agent called the police. Priorities, people! Then Frank Junior's manager called Frank Sr., Frank Sr. charters a plane to Reno, which is the closest he could get to Tahoe. He calls Nancy, his former wife, and he calls his mother in Jersey. Dolly is left frantically counting her rosary. Sr. also calls Peter Lawford, and I need to give you a wee bit of background here. Get out your pen and paper for a flowchart if you haven't already. Peter Lawford was the son of an English knight commander, back when the crown wasn't handing out knighthoods to every Tom, Dick, or Harry entertainer. Despite Lawford's acting career, or maybe because of it, Lawford still ran in some pretty posh circles, and he ended up marrying JFK's sister, Patty. Lawford and Sinatra Sr. had been close, but Sinatra had some friends, such as those the Kennedys could not afford even the hint of association with, the most prominent of which was Sam Giancana. Uh, Yes, I do mean Momo of the Chicago 42s, and top guy in the Chicago mob. So Lawford had been trying to keep his distance from Frank Sr. However, the men had been, as far as it goes, friends, and they still had an affinity towards one another. So Frank calls Peter and tells him he needs Peter to call Robert Kennedy, also the nation's attorney general, and get the FBI on the case ASAP. Regardless of the problems between all of them, Kennedy is set to the FBI on the case immediately. Meeting Sinatra's plane in Reno was the DA for the Tahoe area, four Nevada-based FBI agents, Frank's attorney, and his new publicist. Then Frank Sr. waited 16 hours for contact from the kidnappers. Some of that 16-hour wait was Keenan and Amsler's drive time from Tahoe to LA. Whatever the remaining reason was, who knows, time to sleep? But it wasn't until a quarter to five the next evening when the kidnappers made contact. John Irwin made the call using a script Keenan had written. All he said on this call was that Frank Jr. was safe, unharmed, and they would call again later. How they knew where to call is a bit of a mystery. I hate to say this because I want to give these guys more credit, but I think knowing where to get a hold of Frank Sr. was luck, and part of the reason they didn't call for so long. The only way they would know where Frank was was by reading the newspaper. The logical assumption would be that he was still in L.A. The kidnappers themselves were in L.A. Both Frank Sr. and Nancy Sr. lived in the L.A. area. And I have a vision of these guys getting all the way back to the valley and preparing to call. What? Wait, guys, what, what's the number? What number? The phone number. I don't have a number. How can you not have the number? Even if they were somehow able to con the switchboard operator, look it up, it's a thing into giving them Frank Sinatra's phone number, he wouldn't have answered. He was in Reno. So anyway, they make the first call, and for the remainder of the seven calls, I mean, why so many? Yes, seven calls. Keenan insists on calling specific payphones for which Frank is told to be at at certain times of the day. When later finally came and Irwin called back, Frank offered them $1 million right up front. But Irwin has a script. And apparently, no one needs a million dollars. So Irwin says, no, no, that's fine. We just want 240. 240,000. We'll call again with instructions, they say again. The FBI told Sinatra to allow the Bureau to track the money in order to find the kidnappers. Sinatra calls his banker and returns to L.A. to wait. When the kidnappers call with the drop instructions, he is to put the bag of cash in between two school buses in Sepulveda in the wee hours of the morning. Everything goes smoothly when Keenan and Amsler go to grab the money. 
But Erwin, never completely gung-ho on the whole plan, decides it is his opportunity to let Frank Jr. go. He releases Frank Jr. within two miles of his mother's home. Junior is found wandering around Bel Air by a security guard who pops Frankie in the trunk to get him past the press and delivers him to his mother. Once home, Frank Jr. tells law enforcement what he knew. Although he had been blindfolded, he spent time talking with the three kidnappers and had a decent impression of where he was being held. The feds were able to trace the house where Junior had been. In the meantime, Irwin's conscience was getting to him. Erwin ultimately claims that he had actually only gone along with the kidnapping plan as a weird kind of chaperone. Erwin saw himself as a standard for young men, and Keenan in particular. He told the court during his trial that he was only in on the plan to encourage Keenan to do the right thing, and to make sure that Barry didn't do anything stupider than trying to kidnap Frank Sinatra's son in the first place. When Keenan went to get the money, Irwin says that he figured he should let Frank Jr. go to ensure Keenan didn't do something foolish upon his return. Once Keenan gets back and divvies up the cash, Irwin's conscience immediately starts gnawing at him. He ends up confessing to his brother, and his brother calls the FBI. Once the feds have Irwin, Amsler and Keenan are close behind. From the money drop to federal custody is three days. During the trial, the defense tried to argue that Sinatra Jr. had planned it all as a publicity stunt. Keegan probably got the idea while guarding the kidnappee. Reportedly, Frank Jr. said he thought the ticket sales would be booming once the news got out about the kidnapping. When the feds tracked the money to Keegan and Torrance's safety deposit box, they found a confession written prior to the crime by Keenan. Oops. The three men were convicted. Keenan and Amsler were both sentenced to life, plus 75 years. Irwin was sentenced to 16 years, 8 months. Anyone else do a double take with that? I really don't want to downplay how awful kidnapping is, but that just seems like a lot of time. Like, a whole lot. It gets crazier, though. Keenan was paroled in 1968. Amsler and Irwin were paroled in 1967. So they all got a bajillion years, but were out in four? What kind of crazy shit is that? Since their release, Keenan made a mint in real estate and lobbied Texas for prison reform. Amsler became a working stuntman in Hollywood. And Irwin went back to work in the L.A. County Department of Flood Control. You can't make this shit up. Papa Sinatra and Frank Sinatra Jr. never really developed that bond a son and father often hope for. Senior seemed to naturally have an affinity with his daughter Nancy, but he could never seem to gain anything similar with his son. Frank Jr.'s career never took off in the way his father's did either, but I wouldn't say he wasn't successful. Keenan's plan meant that Frank Sr. was forced to use payphones, and as they say, Frank makes sure he has a pocket full of dimes for the rest of his life, lest he have to do such a thing again. He would always be ready. As per a 2001 michaelcorcoran.net article, around 1994, Barry Keenan took his date to a concert featuring Frank Sinatra Jr. His date really wanted to meet the star, and Keenan was a sponsor, so he took her backstage. She gushed about the show, and Keenan chatted with Frank Jr. for a bit. Quote, There was no spark of recognition in the singer's eyes. As he made his way down the row of well-wishers, he was unaware that he had just been talking to one of the strangers in the night who kidnapped him at gunpoint from a Lake Tahoe motel on December 8, 1963. I didn't think it would be appropriate to tell him who I was, says Keenan, 60, a real estate developer who moved to the Austin area in April. I'm pretty sure he didn't want to be reminded of that time of his life, and I didn't want to be reminded either, end quote. Look, if Keenan and Sinatra Jr. can put it behind them. If you like this podcast, like, rate, and review on whatever service you're using. If you need to comment on or suggest something, you can reach me at Despecta on most of the social media things. Remember, I currently produce this podcast all by my lonesome, so a wee bit of a warning. I am going to take several weeks off to work on some podcast things. If all goes smoothly, I will be back with new cases and some new ways to interact with y'all. 
For now, I will leave you with some oops footage and then walk you out with Nancy Sinatra. I will talk at you the next time on It's All Relic. Their father, you know. Oh, you fucking son of a... No, hold on. I have done something bad. That was my cat. Oh, God. Where did it go? Shit. Fuck. Dooby 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 doo dooby dooby doo dooby dooby doo. Oh, my God. I fucking hate it when this happens. McGinnis believed, oh, fuck, what is this shit? And Irwin went back to work in the L.A. Department, L.A. County Department, flood, oh boy, no, oh my God, no matter their proximity. We have MMA going on upstairs with the fur babies. She's suffering from a bullet wound to the head. What is up with that shit? She's not suffering. She did. You keep playing where you shouldn't be playing And you keep thinking that you'll never get burned Ha! I just found me a brand new box of matches, yeah And what he knows you ain't had time to learn These boots are made for walking And that's just what they'll do one of these days these boots are gonna walk all over you Are you ready, Boots? Start walking 